A warm welcome to you. Um, that was a last, it's a tough act to follow the last session, but we'll do our, our best. And thank you very much for coming back uh, to, the, to our final session um, late this afternoon on women, uh, war, and peacemaking. Um, who am I? David Marshall uh, from the UN in New York. Um, I cover human rights issues, mainly in fragile states, most recently in South Sudan. Um, so I'm going to set up the panel, uh, the, the sort of the theme, the, 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 the main purpose of the discussion, and then introduce the panel members if I can build on what the First Minister had said um, to do so, which is in 2000, there was a groundbreaking resolution by the UN Security Council um, uh, on women, peace, and security. And in a nutshell, as the First Minister said, it said that a prerequisite to states transitioning out of conflict to peace, for that peace to be meaningful and lasting, there had to be gender equity. Um, and that was uh, a core theme of that resolution in 2000. And there's been a lot of considerable activity since then. And I thought, what a terrific idea 15 years on to really reflect upon where are we? Um, as Robert knows, within the UN system, I'm a big fan of knowledge and learning about who we are, what works and why, and what doesn't work and why. So where are we in, in the world? Uh, this will be predominantly a, the UN world. Where are we in that, um, in that goal to see gender equity um, in states that are transitioning out of conflict in, in, into peace? Um, because to me, and these are just my views, and we'll break it out to the panel, then, then to you, 2015 looks pretty grim, I'd suggest to you. Look at the crisis um, in terms of the sexual crimes crisis we have in northern Nigeria with Boko Haram. Almost two years ago, we had almost 200 girls and women kidnapped, um, and we haven't seen them since. Uh, we have a crisis against women and girls in Somalia by the Al Shabaab. We clearly have a crisis in northern Iraq and in Syria. Um, and this is where I suggest it seems that this crime is specifically targeted against women and girls. It's not a byproduct. We've often been talking about the byproduct of conflict is the impact on women and girls. We also have that. We have you know, terrible displacement of mainly women and girls in South Sudan, which is, has been my focus for the last two years, um, and, and, uh, and the same in Yemen. So the picture, it seems to me, appears grim, um, but perhaps it's not. So let, that's the discussion today we'll have with the panel members, and I hope we can also bring you in in that, in that conversation as well. So that's the setup for you. Let's now turn to introductions um, of the panel members, and I, I'll start, if I may, Pamela, on my, on my right with Pamela Hogan, um, an American um, uh, based in the US who's a well-known Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker. Um, and most recently has been the executive producer and co-creator of a series of movies for PBS, sort of the BBC version in the, the U.S., as you may know, on this theme of women in, in conflict. Um, there's a series of five films. I believe the first one was shown in Peebles last night, mm -hmm. and that related to Liberia. Um, you're also, I think, on the executive board for the International Center for Transitional Justice, uh, an important think tank based in New York. So, Pamela... Um, a warm welcome to you. you. Uh, next is Afra Nassar, um, who as you just heard is one of the new fellows here at Beyond Borders um, from Yemen. Um, she has fled Yemen, is based in Sweden, uh, a journalist, a, a human rights blogger, um, and the co-founder most recently of Yemen Salon, which is an NGO based in Sweden that looks around um, cultural issues uh, and, and conflict. Uh, a warm welcome to you. And you're from Sana, I believe, uh, yeah. originally, where I was about there about a year and a half ago. Um, on my left um, is a member of parliament uh, from the Iraqi uh, parliament. Um, her seat's in Baghdad, <coughs> if, I, if I recall. Uh, and this is Sharuk Tawik Tafwik al Abaya Yachi. Um, a warm welcome to you, a well known human rights activist uh, in Iraq, elected, I believe, for the first time in 2014 and founder of the Iraq Women's uh, Network. Yeah. Robert Dan, um, uh, at the end, is uh, a well-known senior um, UN official who deals with the topic, really, I mean, the, the larger topic of mediation. He heads the mediation support unit in New York, um, but he himself is um, well-experienced in issues around 
mediation, conflict mediation and prevention. Um, Cyprus uh, in Syria, I believe Robert was on the, the he was the advisor to cope with others, the advisor to Kofi Annan on the, the Syria peace talks. He's also done mediation work in the Middle East around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and has also, by the most recently, I think you were in Addis working around issues to do, to do with South Sudan and the, the peace agreement in South Sudan. So, terrific panel. Um, and welcome to all of you. So, let's start, uh, if we may, uh, f at a country uh, specific context, and let's look at Iraq and, and, and Yemen. And if I can turn to you, if I may, uh, if we can ask, really, if I can ask a question about Iraq. Um, so the UN go in, go big with the US in 2003. Those of you may know the UN pulled out and returned in 2006, but the international community, particularly the Americans, have had a heavy footprint in Iraq since 2003. Billions spent, not only on hardware, military hardware, but on helping to build a state, civil society, the assembly, uh, both law reform um, uh, and structural reform but the first question I, I, for you is where are we, what's, uh, how has the, uh, the involvement of the UN and the international community, how has it changed the role of women since 2003? What's changed? Good evening, everybody. Uh, to answer this question, I have to give you an idea about the Iraqi women for and uh, post-2003. Iraqi women uh, were well known to be highly educated, uh, having a a role, a strong role in uh, the society, in the families, and uh, because of the wars and sections uh, before 2003, under the war, you know, men, they were busy in the fronts and uh, uh, women were uh, really running the society, the governmental institutions, and uh, even under sanctions where the uh, economic conditions were very harsh to the Iraqis and uh, middle class uh, has almost destroyed uh, because of these uh, sanctions. Iraqi women were really the, the, the power or the uh, soldiers that, that they kept the society together. They were uh, uh, working, uh, as I said, in the government because uh, the leading positions in the government uh, run by, by women and in the society, uh, feeding the families, uh, men mainly, uh, some uh, mostly died in the fronts and so on. So when 2003 and uh, the rid of dictatorship uh, come so quickly, uh, women were prepared to continue this mm. role and to to make the uh, the this skills and and uh, experience accumulated uh, to to put it in rebuilding a new Iraq to have their position, the real position, what they really deserve uh, in shaping the new uh, future and reality of Iraq. Actually, there has not been seen as much uh, as was expected uh, and should be. Um, there were kind of conflict for sharing the, the power, mainly by, by political parties. At that time, uh, Iraqi women went uh, strongly to uh, work in the civil society. At the beginning, uh, or I mean, the beginning after 2003, um, if you, and I was deeply involved in the civil society, um, most uh, NGOs were run by women and, and in a very uh, hard uh, circumstances. We, we ran uh, or we want, went to the rural areas where really people are in, in very uh, bad uh, situations and educated uh, uh, villages and so on. So uh, the, the whole world, the international community was prepared for post-conflict uh, programs. So they put Iraq under the category of post-conflict society, which means that there are specific programs in, for women, empowering women, for uh, uh, good governance, and so on. So the programs were ready. And they, the, the UN, of course, based on uh, some uh, practices and, and uh, accumulated lessons in other ways of uh, post-conflict societies, so they wanted to put this expertise in uh, their programs in Iraq to empower women and to let them have their own role in 
building Iraq. But actually, the this was not so uh, not uh, planned uh, as uh, the Iraqis expected or the women wanted to, mm -hmm. because there have been a lot of uh, factors. Uh, for instance, the the idea was that Iraqi women were highly educated, were under sanctions and wars. Many of the women they left schools, and there there has been a gap between the elder generations and young generations. The older generations were really highly educated. The sanctions in 1991. You're talking 1991 to yes. 2003, almost uh, 15 years, 14 right. years, destroyed a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this gap between the generations in education uh, yeah. affected the society. And when you address uh, programs uh, for empowering women, for instance, you should take this in consideration and not just put it as a post-conflict uh, society and that's all. So many other uh, factors should be taken uh, in consideration in designing the programs for uh, empowering women in Iraq. Also, so can I just pause, I'm going to ask you a question and interrupt you if I may, Shuruk. So the narrative in Iraq has been, I'd suggest for the last 10 plus years, has been a security crisis narrative. Yes. So hasn't that pushed out, uh, that hasn't that sort of consumed all the oxygen in the room for any discourse over uh, equity, gender equity, and whether it's representation in national assemblies or the role in lawmaking or no, uh, strong uh, advocacy voice? What's the uh, impact been on what I, if you agree with me, on the security crisis narrative we've had for 10 years? Yeah, of course, security is a big uh, issue now in Iraq. I, I mean, you mentioned uh, North Iraq uh, as an example for, for uh, uh, the grim picture that we are facing, but I have to mention uh, the 3,000 Yazidi women under the uh, control of ISIS. This has not happened in, 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 in the new centuries. You mentioned the 200 women in Nigeria. We all, uh, we, we remember this and we, we know how uh, uh, President Obama, for instance, they, uh, he appealed for an emergency plan to release them from Boko Haram. While we have over 3,000 Yazidi women under the control of ISIS, they, they are literally uh, sexual uh, slavery, and we don't see uh, such an em uh, emergency plan to release them from, the, from these uh, monsters. Uh, we hear a, a lot of uh, stories uh, from the, some women that they could run away from them. Terrible stories, but uh, in the, uh, on the other sides, we don't see uh, an action plan for that. So the security is really bad. And one of the reasons that we uh, realized from the beginning that women were, uh, be, we have been marginalized to play their strong role in shaping the political process in Iraq. And this is one of the factors that we, we came to such a, one of the factors, not the only reason, but one of the factors that women didn't play their own role in peace building and in establishing the, uh, vic really a, a, a society that men and women share the responsibilities for building a new Iraq, for uh, having a, a, a real reconciliation between uh, the parties or the, the social component in Iraq. This is one of the reasons okay. that we came to this situation. Thank you, Shuruk. I'll come back to you with another question, but if I may turn now to Yemen, uh, Afra, um, and just before the, the most recent um, in a bombing campaign by the coalition led by the Saudis, there was a peace process in place called the National Dialogue of some number of years that the UN was involved with, with others. Um, that seems to have gone all to pot right now. The, the crisis, particularly for us, is incredibly grave with it apparently seems the coalition are moving towards Sana, the capital, to take it. Uh, and we know that'll have a terrible impact on civilians, particularly women and, and children. So before we had the recent bombing campaign, gender equity in Yemen, uh, particularly through the national dialogue to bring peace, lasting peace in Yemen, looked like what? Well, um, it was like uh, a mini parliament that was uh, uh, trying to reflect the modern uh, reality of Yemen. Because Yemen's parliament was kind of outdated uh, by the time the uprising started in 2011. So the National Dialogue came as an uh, alternative platform where 
everyone uh, or the, the design or the plan was that all segments of the society and all political spectrum uh, is included in that uh, dialogue. Um, there are many critics uh, against the national dialogue, but there are also many who supported the national dialogue, and that's why it continued uh, for, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, almost one year and two months. Uh, and and, and um, I, I would uh, say I was one of the, the people who had critique against the national dialogue because it was uh, designed, uh, in my opinion, it was designed from um, a Western democracy perspective, which does not necessarily uh, fit the Yemeni context. Um, um, to begin with, you cannot have a transitional uh, um, uh, political process when you uh, toppled a president who is regarded, um, I mean, we can debate on this, he's regarded as a dictator and give him impunity and still give him a space in the country. And, and you can't uh, um, let go of a dictator with his own conditions. So that's one, one, one uh, reservation that I have against the national dialogue. And the second is uh, the, 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 the issue with Yemen that make it kind of uh, problematic for, for um, uh, for foreign policy for many countries is that they don't understand that Yemen has this kind of uh, uh, legacy where the tribes work or act as a state and the state act as a tribe. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that does not necessarily mean that tribe are a negative aspect of uh, the, the social construction in Yemen. In fact, they can be um, a very instrumental tool in, 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 in nation building and, 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 and so on, and, and, ev and even to promote democratic values and so on, because tribes have their own ways of exercising to democracy. And, and that's where my, uh, like my feminist uh, uh, conscious come in, because women are not included in that uh, tribal system of uh, um, governance. Uh, so the national dialogue, uh, in my opinion, was designed based on Western democracy perspective that did not really fit. So if I can interrupt you then, one of the major I think, concerns that the UN has um, uh, in Yemen for a long time has been the role of forced child marriage. Um, uh, how was that addressed by civil society in the national dialogue? Um, it was um, uh, well, um, within the national dialogue, there were very courageous women uh, who, uh, in my opinion, uh, were smarter and more competent than the, the, the men in the national dialogue. Uh, if you compare their CVs, I assume they have more uh, qualities uh, or uh, they're like, they are titled to be there more than the men. Um, um, and this is from my uh, experience uh, working as a journalist prior to the uh, uprising uh, in 2011. I've been working as a journalist since 2008, and I've always been en engaged with the civil society uh, uh, organizations, and women are the vibrant uh, actors. So child marriage and women issues in general have been really, like there has been a lot of noise about them uh, within the national dialogue. Uh, and, and, and they were working day and night and preparing like statements and manifestos and in and, and a way to push forward for legislations and, and implementing uh, real change in, in the, the bigger uh, governmental institutions, uh, policies and so on. Um, uh, I, I, I would say it was uh, like uh, there has been a history to women's struggle that the national dialogue was kind of a window where it was kind of structured. Uh, so um, it, it, they have done a lot of homework before the national dialogue, but that was a space where really 
things uh, um, were materialized. So whatever materialized, any whatever the gains may have been over gender rights, is all all has been lost with the camp with the bombing campaign, the the, the crisis in Yemen. The, the, this again a new crisis in Yemen. The country's on fire basically. Those gains are where is it all for nothing? I say this with a great pain in my heart. Everything is lost uh, uh, while Yemen is under fire now. Like basically everything. Um, uh, n today, it's not really about gender issues. It's not really about women empowerment. It's really life or death. Yeah. People are being bombarded from the sky and from the ground. Um, as you mentioned, yes, there is a, um, a, a, a airstrike campaign led by the Saudi uh, coalition. So basically, 11 Arab countries got uh, um, uh, collected by the Saudi Arabia to go and bombard uh, Yemen. And the other 11 Arab countries are um, watching in silence. But prior to that also, there has been a civil war that started kind of one week before the, the, um, uh, the airstrikes. So there is uh, uh, the, the, the party of the Houthi and Saleh coalition um, and, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, uh, and the southerner uh, with, uh, with President Hadi. Hadi. Um, so, and that was kind of what triggered Saudis to go and intervene. And ever since, so far, we've, we've lost more than 4,000 people who are uh, um, uh, killed uh, in a, a different, uh, like, uh, related aspects of the conflict because people, um, uh, if you're not killed by, by the airstrike, you can die because of lack of medicine or food. So it's a, a catastrophic uh, humanitarian situation that we have in Yemen. And I cannot stress enough how, for me, it sounds kind of irrelevant when I speak about uh, women in conflict. And I, I actually, I, I want to stress on, on me being here today. It's really because of women who really inside the conflict could not get a visa or could not uh, have an access to the to the airport could not um, I don't know at, at the moment I'm speaking right now I don't know if my family are being bombarded or not so uh, um, the situation in Yemen is uh, it's beyond my, my my words even even my English can betray me um, uh, I'm a native Arabic speaker and 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 uh, I know I can express myself more in, in Arabic but I cannot even, uh, like, I, I feel like the English just does not really describe what, what I want to, the picture that I want to present. But, but I, if, you, if you allow me just to take one, one minute, really, is to being in UK, it gives me kind of, I have some ambivalent feeling being here because there have been, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here and speak and, and given this chance to speak about the situation in Yemen and maybe tell something that's beyond the headlines uh, uh, about the situation in Yemen. But uh, I, I want the audience to understand that the UK has a role uh, and the European Union has a role that they have to take responsible uh, of. Um, um, there have been reports about uh, weapons uh, uh, being um, uh, transported from uh, companies in the UA uh, through uh, to, to the Saudis or the Emiratis that are used in, uh, in Yemen. And, and I, I urge the audience, really, if you would like to have any kind of solidarity act with uh, Yemenis, really to push your politician, maybe, in one way or another, to really stop the violence immediately. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, Pamela, over to you. If um, you're looking at this from a, a, a different angle, sort of a long form angle, through film uh, and through your documentary series um, uh, that you've co-produced, a series of five films, can you share with us one story um, around a woman's role in conflict mediation, prevention, peace building? 
Thank you. Um, well, my colleagues, Abby Disney and Ginny Redeker and I, uh, several years ago, just felt uh, that there was a kind of a blind spot in the media's reporting on war, uh, that women either were tended to be left out of the picture, or if they were included, tended to be portrayed as, as victims, kind of one-dimensional. And we just knew from our own reporting that there were very important stories out there that, that weren't being told. And, and given that um, in so many conflicts today, it is more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier, and that um, that civilians, as in Yemen, are really the target of, of war so often now, and, and the majority tend to be women and children, that those are very important stories to tell, to look at the changing role of women in war. Um, the one role we didn't look at that we wanted to, but it was hard enough to raise the money, this is public television in America, in America um, was the fact that there are also more women in the military now all over the world. Um, that's another story, and I hope someone will tell that story. So the, um, I wanted to, I was co-creator of this five-part series with Ginny and Abby and executive producer, but in the film that I directed, I wanted to focus on sexual violence as a target of war. So I looked at all the current conflicts, but realized that in the 1990s, um, after the Rwanda and Bosnia wars, um, some important um, legal precedents had been set in, in the first international tribunals since Nuremberg. Um, and that really, f in the, for the first time in history, women who had been targeted in these wars had been willing to come forward and take the witness stand, which had never happened at Nuremberg. So um, I discovered a, a story in the town of Focha in Bosnia, Focha was one of the first towns to be attacked by Serb-led forces, and at the time that it was attacked, it was half Muslim, half Christian. And um, so what happened was when the attacks came, though everyone was rounded up uh, that hadn't been able to flee, and then the women were separated from the men, and they were imprisoned in their own town for months, in the schools, in the community centers, under the watchful eye of the police, who were right there, right next door, actually, to one of the um, imprisonment centers. So years later, when Richard uh, uh, Goldstone became the head of the Yugoslav Tribunal, he said he told me that the first day he arrived in his office, um, there were literally over 3,000 letters on his desk from people all over the world saying, do something about what happened to the women of Bosnia. And so one of the things that he did was that he and his team hired, made a point of bringing in f some female judges, some female prosecutors, and some female investigators um, who then joined forces with women's organizations in Bosnia who had taken copious testimony, thousands of testimonies, tracked down these women who were now living all over the world, had fled. Um, and 16 of these women from Focha agreed to become part of a trial. And this was many years after the war. So the kind of courage that it took for them, they'd gone on with their lives. Maybe they'd gotten married, they'd had children, they had a new romantic partner. To then pick up and fly 800 miles to The Hague was extraordinary. And their testimony, in fact, um, set uh, international precedent where sexual violence was classified as a crime against humanity. Um, and, and that precedent is being used today at, at the ICC and other international tribunals. So our story is, is about them. And I, and I will say um, that partway through our research, we stopped using the word victim. Mm -hmm. Just was so wrong and started using the word survivor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, within Bosnia, um, there was a movement at the time during the war to redefine these women who had been targeted in this way all over the country and to call them heroes. And literally in mosques, there were community gatherings where imams were talking about this and saying, we need to think differently about these women as they come back to our communities. We're not going to shun them. We're going to call them heroes. Um, so, you know, that, that terminology was just, you know, it was such a shift, I think, for all of us. And, um, and I think the partnership between these women and the female investigators is, 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 is quite um, crucial to the story. Um, so that's that's one of the stories that we share in our series. You, there are t five stories in total. Mm. Um, how will a, a UK audience get access to those? Oh, um, okay, so do you all have this booklet? They're all going to be shown next week in Edinburgh at um, the Summer Hall venue. And um, also, if any of you are part of NGOs in any country uh, or grassroots groups, 
they're being made, they're made available. Um, they've been translated into Arabic, French, and Spanish, and, and also English, of course. And they're being made available. It's called screening in a box or something, uh, free of charge. And uh, they're being used all over the world. And um, you'd, you'd contact Fork Films, or you can contact me, and I'll put you in touch with Fork Films if you want to use them for community screenings. Emma, thank you. Terrific. Robert, over to you. Um, and um, so we've built up, we have a whole body of principles post-2000 about achieving gender equity, whether it's around greater protection to women and girls against sexual violence, whether it's around public, greater public participation in developing, creating the machinery of a democratic state. So what happens when these principles meet the reality of a peace process? What does that look like? Thank you. Um, well, it looks very interesting and it's quite difficult. Um, uh, the particular angle that I have on this on this story is that of of of, of a person who has watched um, and supported senior UN envoys uh, try to um, bring parties together uh, to, to to reach agreements that that, that manage or resolve conflicts. Um, so that's 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 one particular angle of this problem. It's a different angle from 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 the angle of of what happens if the if the conflict is over and one is looking to. To, to build certain capacities in a society, etc., um, and uh, any mediator in this situation is, is before they even start doing anything, um, is is first of all uh, hungry for knowledge and hungry for insight into into what a society is and what makes it tick. Because unless a mediator is from the society itself, which sometimes happens, uh, and in our own societies, we've probably all seen figures start to mediate things inside our, our countries, but, but most of the time the mediator is not of the country uh, and, and uh, spends months uh, doing what you might call uh, taking compass bearings and trying to understand in all its complexity not only a very a, 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 a complex society but also a complex conflict in that society. And I think one thing that we have learned is that the first day you start doing that, you should start talking to the women in the society. In other words, that your, your understanding of what is actually happening in a war uh, is, is enriched by, by and it's logical, of course, it would, it, it, it is enriched by talking to everybody. And there, there, has, there was a bit of a paradigm in the old days, that, you know, you would, you would essentially be talking to the political leaders and uh, newsflash, uh, most of them uh, are men. Um, uh, and, and, and so your, your insight into you know what? Why in, in this local community? What? Why are people taking up arms? Or, or, or what? What actually does it mean uh, to, uh, uh, to to a society to to, to, to the community uh, to to have this particular blockage of services or anything like that? So that women, uh, that talking to women, talking to them as combatants, talking to them as NGO activists, talking to them as mothers, talking to them as wives of the combatants, talking to them in all these different capacities. It, it, it just enriches the mediator's understanding of the situation. And, and, and the first, the original sin of any third party getting involved in anything is ignorance. And so that, that, that's the first sort of principle that I think we, we try to apply. And I, I feel that if we, if we actually look at how at least UN envoys are working, I think they're doing this, this, this particular aspect of their job better than they were before. It doesn't mean that it's working. Uh, and these these societies are these conflicts are all very difficult. But if we we actually do measure and we, we keep tracks of of who our envoys are talking to, uh, and we and 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 the, the the evidence does suggest that they are increasingly regarding it as normal and essential to engage with a wide uh, range of people, including uh, with 50% of the population uh, in as wide in, in all its diversity. I think the other thing that a mediator is looking for in a political process is legitimacy. Uh, the, 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 the question is not so much what can you get on a piece of paper and who can you get to sign it, but what can you, what can you get that actually m may last and may actually start to address, not just, not just silence the guns, but start to address some of the drivers of conflict. And here too, um, uh, how the process is actually visually and substantively constructed uh, is very relevant to what the, the legitimacy that the outcome will enjoy in that society. And so we, we increasingly are trying to design inclusive uh, political processes. Um, I, sh I want a, a, a cautionary word here. Um, the mediator is not 
some uh, god who comes in and can dictate uh, how the parties will behave and who they will bring to the table uh, and so forth. The mediator um, uh, may themselves be subject to, to limitations from the parties on what they consent to and may often have to be actually ensuring that the mediator even has the consent to continue working uh, among parties uh, who, who, are in, who are in existential or deeply violent relationships. Uh, but but uh, within bearing that in mind, uh, the mediator, uh, if, if, if he or she is a good mediator, will not simply accept what the main warring parties say, let's take in South Sudan at the moment, would not necessarily accept that what Mr. Salva Kiir and Mr. Rik Mashar say is a well-designed process would in fact be a well-designed process. And the mediator would try to assert control over the process and to ensure that that, that therefore the parties understand that the table, that the process is more than just one table, that there is more than one table. Uh, so there may be a table where the political leaders bargain, but there should be other tables, and there should be connections from those tables to the main table. Uh, and to the extent that one can, the main table should have women and men at it, but uh, in those situations where that's not happening, because let's face it, uh, the, the, all the advisors around the warlord and the leader and the, and the general and the so-and-so are all of a certain uh, type, um, that, the, that the mediator is looking for other ways to bring these voices always into the process. And so, if you like, um, uh, my, my, my general appreciation of the situation is that we, have, we are taking more seriously than we did before that, that the inclusion question isn't just a question of human rights and of gender equity, but it's a question of quality and the effectiveness of a process. And that therefore, if, you're, if, you're, um, uh, if your goal is in fact long-term peace and peace building in a society, you're not doing quality work if you're not, if you're not taking this, this into account. I mean, I think um, David quite rightly at the outset asked a pretty hard question. You know, the world seems pretty grim and gloomy and, and, and conflict today is, seems prevalent in more and more places. Uh, and that does, that's how it feels, I have to tell you, when you wake up in the morning and uh, go, to, go to work uh, uh, in, a, in a part of the UN that's looking at conflict prevention and mediation. There, there seems to be a proliferation of, of conflict challenges and also a proliferation of would-be mediators. And so that's another whole subject uh, uh, that, 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 that also uh, impacts the situation. So I would, I'm not sure that actually we, have, we are making peace more than we did before. But what I would say is that within, w within the, 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 the limits of, of the, the, the violent world that we, are, that we are facing and the many difficult challenges, I think we're doing a, a, a better job in understanding that one needs to have gender on the table and women at the table. Uh, and, that, and that the envoy and, 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 and international officials have a, um, a leadership responsibility here. It's, it's one of those things that you can actually choose to do or not to do. Uh, you, you can choose to set up your, your first round of consultations with the parties uh, and decide who you're going to talk to. Uh, and so that's within your gift. So it, it, there are other things that will not be in your gift. It may not be in your gift to determine quite what the political bargain will be on certain aspects. But that aspect of it is in your gift and you should exercise that gift in a way that maximises the prospects that you'll be bringing um, more and more of these participants into the process and more and more of these issues are on the table. Um, a, 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 a one last little thing that I thought I'd finish with a story here. Um, uh, a lot of mediation processes, they, 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 they sort of, they have months or years of gestation and they, they're, they're, like a, they're like jazz and, and uh, there's riffs over here and things happen and th things fail and uh, come back together again. And but there usually comes a moment where, where there's a chance of getting some sort of deal or there isn't. Um, and I, I think, interestingly, those are very powerful moments. Uh, and the people who are actually in the room at those moments make decisions that affect societies for a long time. And uh, I think one of the things that's healthy today is that I think no UN official that I'm aware of could be in those rooms and not have along the checklist of things that they are thinking about the gender and woman question. And uh, I th th my story here is that um, um, uh, we, were, we were involved in the Syria process in Ju June 2012. And um, the, you may recall that in February 2012, uh, Kofi Annan was appointed as the joint UN Arab League mediator for Syria. 
So Ban Ki-moon, his successor as Secretary General, turned to him and asked him to take on uh, what was widely viewed as a mission impossible. The conflict had already been going for a year uh, and um, uh, the Arab League uh, had sought to mediate the conflict until then and the conflict had essentially overpowered uh, the League and was getting more and more violent uh, by the day. And I think we all felt that the conflict was at a moment where either one would quickly marshal the forces towards some kind of a political process or it would go off a cliff. Uh, and so Kofi Annan took on this role and, and he, he the, the, the conflict, of course, has four different layers. You know, you've got, a, you've got a lot of local conflicts, you've got a lot of national level conflicts, you have a lot of regional uh, impacts into the conflict, and then you have a large international conflict, essentially, over Syria. And, and a mediator is trying to bring all of these four rings into some alignment and to try to find some consensus on some of these rings that can then flow through to the other rings. So his view was that unless and until I could get the main players in the Security Council and the main players uh, in the region behind a common roadmap for Syria, we weren't likely to get very far. And so he, he attempted in June 2012 to convene what was called the Action Group on Syria and to uh, have that Action Group endorse essentially some sort of a roadmap for a, for a negotiated political uh, settlement in Syria. And uh, as part of that process, of course, lots and lots of players were giving their inputs, including Hillary Clinton. Uh, who, of course, is a champion uh, of, of women's inclusion and gender issues and so forth. Uh, the Russians were giving their inputs. All sorts of regional players were giving their inputs and so forth. But it was only the UN that actually was drafting the thing. Uh, and I will say that um, uh, no one, none of those players, none of them mentioned gender at all uh, in any of the ideas that they gave to the UN envoy. Uh, including, no, including Hillary. Well, I, 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 I said that, yes. Okay. Um, and, and, and if I may, it's not her, it, 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 just to understand what political processes are like, she probably leapt off a plane from heaven knows what other process she had. The papers were prepared by the State Department. She was furiously working on heaven knows what else. It wasn't, and, and of course, the main po question of political contestation is not this. The main question of political contestation is the future of President Assad uh, and, and, the, and, and how this would be reflected. In, in something that would have both Russian and American buy-in. Uh, and so what tends to happen in a process is that all the political energy focuses on these questions. And those of us who are actually responsible for thinking about what a, how a political process might unfold have the luxury of thinking about all the other questions and trying to then construct a framework that, that, that doesn't just deal with that but deals with all of other things. And so, um, you know, UN officials were able to insert into that document that is now sort of the only, the only thing, the only sort of, it remains three years later, the only little thing that everyone roughly agrees upon, even though they have different interpretations of it. Uh, but they were able to insert into that document very important principles about women's inclusion in the process that must follow. Uh, and so, uh, it, I'm just, I'm, gi I'm giving this to you as a, as a, just to remind you that these are very messy, complicated uh, political endeavours. But that I think that the more of us who are thinking about the, the gender and women aspect of it, the better over time the outputs will be. One last fact. Um, since, until 2011, only three peace agreements in the world had ever referred to conflict-related sexual violence as a prohibition under a ceasefire. Uh, and since, we, since we've actually started to study this and, and issue guidance to people, it's, it's almost, it's, it's almost a, a, a point of shame now to try to draft a ceasefire and not include that uh, in, in the definition of, of an act that is prohibited under the ceasefire. So there is progress. Uh, there, there, there is more awareness of this, but, but the, the actual the reflection of this in real peace in real people's lives, uh, we still have a long way to go. Terrific, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, we have five minutes left, so over to you. Uh, the floor is open for anyone who may have some questions, um, preferably questions, please, as opposed to call, you know, comments, thoughts, observations. Uh, questions, madam? Yes. Micro, um, microphone here. Why then do you think it has taken so long for that to come equitably into the process and the thinking and the planning? I mean, I find it quite sad that it seems to have taken so long. I think um, uh, it goes back to the point that I made earlier about what does the mediator control versus what they don't control. So um, in, in, uh, it's quite challenging, I'll be honest. Uh, to say to uh, President so-and-so of such-and-such a country, when you turn up next week for these peace talks, 
among the four people around the table, I need at least two women, please. And he may say, well, uh, as it happens, my foreign minister is a man and my national security advisor is a man and, 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 and so forth. Um, uh, it's equally difficult to say, Mr. Mr. President and so-and-so, uh, uh, various leaders of various opposition groups, we're going to have a whole civil society group also at the same table because their own, their own consent to come to the process may be, may, be, may be limited. So that's what I was trying to say to you before. I think in the past we may have thought of this as a binary choice, either they're at the table or they're not, whereas I think um, we're increasingly working out that in sophisticated design of processes, there's more than one way to achieve uh, having this input uh, at the table. Uh, you, you, I think it's also one needs to be a bit honest that, um, that one is dealing with a whole range of conflicts and, uh, of wars in which uh, societies are at all different stages of, of, of progress or non-progress on this question uh, and it's also a, 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 a question that also then has lots of cultural and religious uh, justifications or overtones. Um, and so I think uh, a lot, it, it may be that we have been too quick in the past to assume that these things tended to dictate that, well, there wasn't much we could do about that, we're trying to stop a war here. We'll get back to that later. Whereas I think what we're now realising is that there are, there are ways, even while doing that, to try to advance this agenda and that it's good for peace to do so. Thank you very much. At the back, please. Um, very, with thank the you very much. Um, it, was, it was very interesting to hear the accounts of women as civilians and, and victims. But the question I have is very specific and it's for our Iraqi friend. What is the problem for women as mediators and the legitimacy of their input in a society which is, in many respects, um, at least as what we read in the West, still very male-dominated? Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, the women in Iraq, they are doing their uh, mediation role and more than that. I mean, uh, they are... Uh, uh, saving lives in, in conflict areas. They do have their, uh, um, their courageous uh, uh, stories. I mean, w there is no time to tell a lot of uh, stories when ISIS came and uh, occupied uh, the areas in, in Mosul and, and Ambar. We, we know a lot of women, they, they saved lives uh, of uh, young soldiers or young people. Uh, risking their lives, their own lives, and, and their uh, sons' uh, lives too. But uh, this is on the on the ground in the community uh, level. The problem is that this effort is not uh, able to be lifted in, to to have their space within the political uh, level. I mean, because of the patriarchic. Uh, attitudes of politicians in Iraq uh, uh, because there is uh, no space for uh, for women to to have uh, really their their what they deserve to to play the, that's why the the role of the women stays in the in the grounds grassroots level and also in the middle uh, middle out as uh, middle out approach which means that uh, they they do their the the best in coherent the, the society, especially we have sectarian uh, conflicts in many many areas, and this sectarian uh, conflicts uh, it came after 2003. I mean, before that we we haven't. There are some social uh, backgrounds, but uh, for me, uh, I, I haven't heard a lot of uh, questions asking me whether I'm. Sunni or Shi, Kurds or Arab, Christian or Muslims, but uh, uh, nowadays, I mean, after 2003, uh, the, the journalists from outside, the, the foreign journalists from US, UK, all over the world, we they came and they see us working, as, for instance, in the Iraqi Women Network, which covers the, the Iraq from north to, to south in, in nationwide campaigns. And we 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 dealing with national issues, but they insist on asking us: Are you Sunni? Are you Shia? Are you Kurds? Are you Arab? Which we, we refuse to answer this question for many years. But at the end of, uh, I mean, after the 2006 and the conflicts were so uh, high that uh, you have to identify this area is Shia, this area is Sunni, and now we try to to. Uh, rebuild this or uh, bridging this uh, gap that has the sectarian gap that has been built on uh, during the last decade 
women are doing their really the best job to uh, refuse uh, the sectarian impact mm -hmm. on the ground between people themselves. So, uh, a lot of uh, things happening. That, of, of course, w women most uh, in Iraq they are the mothers of victims, uh, victims of sectarian conflict. So they they do. Uh, agree on that the enemy is the same. It's not the Sunni or the Shia or, or the others. It's it's the the, the conflict itself. So uh, this is the main role of Iraqi women now in, in 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 the community. But of course, there is a lack of their role in the uh, high political level. Thank you so much. I've been told we have to finish, so my, so my apologies uh, to the back. I'm afraid we can't take any more questions, but if you so wish after the session to come up and speak to the panel members, they'll be more than happy to, to answer those questions. So to all the panelists, thank you all very much uh, for your time and for you for staying.